My name is Mark Polk and this is my RV garage. I got bit by the RV bug when I was 15 years old and still have it today. I started in this industry washing campers and since that time I've helped educate over a quarter million RVers on how to safely and properly use and maintain their RV. My favorite pastimes are RVs, muscle cars, and motorcycles. Welcome to my RV garage. This episode of Mark's RV Garage is sponsored in part by Camping World, KOA, Explore RV Insurance, and Precision Temp. We reached a point where we can't install items like our water heater, our outside shower, and our city water connector until we install the metal on the outside of the trailer. But before we do that, we want to test the electrical system so we can correct any problems while we still have access to all the wiring. We're going to finish wiring the 12 volt coach system and the 12 volt automotive system. Then we can test the entire electrical system and get started on the outside metal. Okay, we're getting ready to test our electrical system, so what we're going to do is uh, I can't really install the outside light until the metal's on, so I'm going to temporarily install it so we can test the light and the switch once we uh, put a battery on the unit. And then we'll just disconnect it, put our metal on, and then make the uh, final connection. <laughs> We want to keep safety in mind, so after we plug the unit into an electrical source for the very first time, we want to perform a hot skin test before we touch any metal on the trailer. Hot skin is when there's a wiring problem like improper grounding that causes the metal on the trailer to be energized. You can get seriously shocked by this condition. To test it, I'm using a non-contact AC tester. First, we want to make sure the tester is working properly by testing it in a live outlet. Most testers will light up or beep when current is present. Now we can test the metal part on the trailer to see if it's hot. Let's plug it in and check it out. Okay, we've got the trailer plugged in. We're just going to turn our tester on. And if there's any kind of problem, the tester is going to let us know. So that's a good sign. We don't have any hot skin issues. Okay, the moment of truth has finally arrived. What we're going to do is uh, test out our electrical system. And the way I plan to do it is to start with the battery. I borrowed a battery from the boat. We're going to go ahead and connect it. We're going to see if all the 12 volt devices in the trailer work directly off the battery. If they do, then what we're going to do is plug the unit in and we're going to see if all the 12 volt items work off the converter then we're going to test all the 120 volt items so let's get our battery connected okay the way this should work is when you have a battery on the front of the RV all the 12 volt devices should work off of the battery without the unit being plugged in where you're using the converter. So we've connected the battery and now we're going to just check these devices for the first time since we did the wiring. Okay, we've got lights, we've got power to the stereo. Let's see if our fan 12 volt fan works. Got the fan. 
Let's see, I remember, you might remember I temporarily wired this outside light so we could test it. Of course, it's on a switch. So we've got our porch light. And then I've got another light inside wired to a switch. And that's this one, so if you come in at night and you want lights, you can just hit that switch. So we've got that. We've got more lights. Let me turn some of this off and we'll uh, test that motorized TV antenna. Okay, I've tested all the 12 volt devices. We've got 12 volts going to our refrigerator. We've got 12 volts to the fan in the bathroom. The only thing we haven't checked is our motorized WineGuard TV antenna. Uh, so the first thing to do is to hit the power button and we do have power and then uh, if we want to raise the antenna and then we can rotate either to the uh, left or to the right and then uh, if we want to stow it Well, that's a good sign. All of our 12 volt devices are operating properly off the battery. The next step is to plug the unit in. That will energize our converter. We'll see if all the 12 volt devices are working off the converter. And then we'll flip one breaker at a time and check our 120 volt devices. Hopefully everything will work out. Okay. Um, Everything's off right now at the panel box. We're going to turn our main 30 amp breaker on. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and hit our 30 amp breaker that lets power come in. And then I actually wired the converter to a dedicated uh, branch circuit of its own. So to, to get the converter to work, I have to turn that breaker on. So right now, all of our 12 volt devices should be operating off the converter. And yep, we've got we've got our lights and everything. So that lets us know that the, the converter is actually working. Now the moment of truth is to start testing some of our 120 volt appliances. And a good place to start with that would be the outlets. So we'll hit that breaker and then uh, we can take a plug-in tester you can see we've got our two lights which indicate that it's wired properly and we do have power and um, this is the last outlet on the circuit so that kinda lets me know that all the other outlets are working of course we got a GFCI we're gonna test it to make sure it's operating properly um, Okay, we've got that. Now what we want to do is flip our breakers on to see if we're getting power to our microwave, our refrigerator, and then of course we'll have our air conditioner. So let's, uh, yep, you can see right here, I think you can see, we've got our power to the microwave. We've got power to the refrigerator, 120 volt. All right, it's about 100 degrees today, so this is what I've been waiting for. We're going to check our air conditioner, and we'll just put it on low cool. And there it goes. Ah, boy. Okay, now that we've tested our electrical system, we can go ahead and start on the outside metal, and then we can install our water heater, our outside shower, and a few other things that had to wait until the metal was on. I know there's going to be questions about a, a vapor barrier when we insulate the trailer, so I want to take a minute and discuss that right now. When you build a house, you use a vapor barrier between the insulation and the outside temperatures to help prevent moisture from building up inside the walls. Your RV is different. 
You use it a few times a year, and then for the remainder of the season, it sits in storage. The temperature and humidity levels in an RV can change drastically compared to a more controlled temperature you would maintain in your house. In this situation, a vapor barrier would actually trap all that moisture in the RV, creating numerous problems like rotting and mold. This is also why it's a good idea to leave some roof vents open for air circulation and ventilation when the RV is being stored, but make sure they have something like Max Air vent covers to help keep any water out. The original plan I had for the exterior metal was to try and use what came on the Yellowstone, but because we've reconfigured so much and, and added windows and, and everything like that, it's going to be virtually impossible. Uh, when that dealer friend of mine went out of business and was having a sale, I purchased six boxes of uh, old metal. This is actually was ordered for a 1972 Winnebago, so it's been sitting in a box for quite some time. And we've got enough of this corrugated panel to do the bottom, and then we've got some smooth panel to put on top. <laughs> Okay, we made our cutouts, and what we wanted to do was hang the metal one more time, verify that all our cutouts were, were in the proper place, proper location. Now we can remove the metal, insulate, install the metal, and then we'll be able to put our new tankless hot water heater by precision temp in. We're making the final preparation to go ahead and put our first piece of metal on, and that's to insulate the walls. Almost all RVs use a, an R7 insulation factor uh, rather than what you would commonly find in a house, which would be like R13. And we just want to make sure that everything is sealed really well. And we've got all our wires and water lines that need to come through the metal ready to go. We're going to go ahead and install our outside shower before we put the water heater in so we have some room under the cabinet to make our water connections. Once that water heater's in, it's going to take up a lot of that room that I have right now to work in. Okay, we've got our butyl tape on, we've got our metal stapled down, and then all we got to do is screw into our two by twos and you don't want to over tighten it but we want that butyl tape to get a good seal and then whenever you install something like this when you get finished you take some clear silicone and just do the top and the corners so any water coming down will be repelled I'm just going to go ahead and do our cable connector going to trim the butyl tape and I'm going to wait before we put our silicone above all these uh, items that we're putting in the metal because we don't know what we're going to do about the paint yet. This actually looks pretty nice. We might leave it if it's not too scratched up but until I know for sure uh, there's a possibility we're going to have to sand this to paint it so we'll just hold off on the silicone.
if there's one appliance in an RV that the owner has a love-hate relationship with, it would be the water heater. We love the fact that we have hot water when we're camping, but we hate the fact that the water in the tank only lasts for a short time, especially if someone with you enjoys taking long, hot showers. We don't need to worry about that in the old Yellowstone. We're installing an RV500 on-demand tankless water heater by Precision Temp. The RV500 delivers on-demand hot water efficiently and conveniently with up to 55,000 BTUs of power. A small 20-pound gas cylinder of propane will provide approximately 940 gallons of shower temperature water. The RV500 is quiet and efficient. For the same amount of propane, the RV500 produces 15 to 20 percent more hot water than a conventional water heater, and because you're not constantly reheating a tank, lots of RVers find that they use 50 percent less propane. I would like to thank Precision Temp for sending the RV500 tankless water heater. Precision Temp manufactures an array of tankless, clean-burning, gas-powered water and space heaters that provide on-demand hot water for RVs, boats, horse trailers, vacation cabins, and even high-volume restaurants. These versatile products can be retrofitted to work in your existing RV, boat, or horse trailer. For more information on the RV500, take a minute to visit www.precisiontemp.com. Let's get busy installing our new tankless on-demand water heater in the old Yellowstone trailer. all my connections to the outside shower so that's completed. Now that we've got the water heater installed, all we have to do is tap into the cold and the hot water lines, run it up, run cold up to the top, run the hot to the bottom. That's the opposite of most water heaters. We're going to route our, our LP gas line and then we've got a dedicated 12 volt wire uh, right here. We're going to make our connection. We will need to get uh, install a switch for the water heater, and we won't be able to do that until we put our cabinet face on. So that's the plan. I'm going to go ahead and make these water connections. Got to make our LP gas connection, our wiring. Okay, we've got our water heater installed, and I just uh, put the face, the cabinet face on, and I cut out for my switch for the water heater. 
ran my filtered uh, DC wiring and power supply up to where the switch is going to be located and then I have my positive and negative connection for the water heater so we're just going to wire our switch and then our water heater is complete. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if you recall or not, but a few days ago when we when we installed the re refrigerator, we also installed a ventilator fan for the refrigerator, and we were waiting to get our cabinet face on to install the switch. Well, here's the switch. Okay, we have our water heater switch wired. We're gonna, I hooked the battery up. We're gonna check it for power. There we go. So our water heater installation is complete. We can actually test the operation of the RV500 until we complete the LP gas system. All of Precision Temp's products are made in America. You can be assured that Precision Temp products are engineered and built for quality and long service life. These products deliver more hot water with greater efficiency and require less maintenance. Now we have water as hot as we want it, for as long as we want it, whenever we want it. For more information on Precision Temp products, visit www.precisiontemp.com. Throughout this restoration project, weights and weight distribution have been a concern. I addressed weights early on when we discussed altering the floor plan and adding new equipment to the mix. The closest weight data I have found to our 67 model is for a 1964 16 foot Yellowstone that was built and equipped similar to ours. The weight was very We can actually test the operation of the RV500 until we complete the LP gas system. All of Precision Temp's products are made in America. You can be assured that Precision Temp products are engineered and built for quality and long service life. These products deliver more hot water with greater efficiency and require less maintenance. Now we have water as hot as we want it, for as long as we want it, whenever we want it. For more information on Precision Temp products, visit www.precisiontemp.com. A roadside because where we added the water heater, microwave, and refrigerator. I did position the refrigerator and microwave slightly forward of the axle to help shift some of that new weight to the trailer's tongue. The only problem is I can't weigh the individual wheel positions until the trailer is roadworthy. I plan to put D or E load rated tires on the trailer and that will basically give me a gross vehicle weight rating of close to 5,000 pounds so I don't think weights will be an issue. And if all goes as planned, the old Yellowstone will be sporting some new disc brakes, so stopping won't be a problem either. If you drive a motorhome, you probably experience issues with the steering from time to time. Steering issues can result from a passing truck, high winds, soft shoulders, and from road wander, just to name a few. Some of these issues can be white knuckle driving experiences. I discovered a product that can prevent all of these steering issues when you're on the road. It's called the Steer Safe. Steer Safe is installed on your vehicle's front steering arms and simply clamps onto the front axle. There's no welding required, you just bolt it on. Once it's installed, the Steer Safe's patented oscillating fulcrum bar makes it the only true steering stabilizer on the market. It provides up to 400 pounds of preset tension on each front wheel working against any outside forces. Steer Safe keeps your front wheels pointing straight even when there's a blowout. Let's get started with the installation right now. Be sure that wheels are in straight ahead position equal distance on both sides. Right. Mount the wheel bracket assembly under the lower steering knuckle with attachment legs facing down and towards the wheel. Place one 3 8 inch U-bolt over the nut and the other one over the lower steering arm. Use the 3 8 inch lock nuts provided and tighten. Be sure the nuts are tight. 
tighten set screws, and then tighten the jam nuts. Make sure to set the wheels in a straight ahead position by measuring from a point that is an equal distance from each wheel. Place the axle bracket on a bench with the fulcrum bar facing up. Place eye bolts in the flat side of the fulcrum bar and run the nuts up on eye bolts until they're finger tight. Place half inch set screws in the tapped holes between the two blocks and make them flush with the opposite side. Turn bracket over with the fulcrum bar facing down. Place one clamp on a half inch by four inch bolt with the short end of the clamp facing up and insert the bolt into one of the holes and place the clamp on the other side with the short end facing up. Use a half inch nut and tighten finger tight. Repeat this on the other end. Place the fulcrum assembly under one end of the axle with the fulcrum bar facing down and towards the wheel. Hook your springs in the wheel bracket and then in the eye bolts and swing the bracket up on the axle. Leave it loose enough to slide on the axle, then pull the bracket towards the center of the vehicle until the springs are straight. Tighten both half inch nuts and then tighten the set screws and the locking nut. Now tighten your eye bolts until the eye is against the fulcrum bar. The eye should be perpendicular. That completes the steer safe stabilizer installation. Steer safe protects against front tire blowouts, potholes, soft shoulders, high winds, wandering, accidental encounters with curbs and high medians. It also reduces driver stress and fatigue. There is no maintenance required because SteerSafe is equipped with Delrin bearings which never require servicing. SteerSafe is available at www.campingworld.com. This vehicle is equipped with SteerSafe. Don't leave home without it. If you would like to learn more about your RV, take a minute to visit our DVD library at www.rveducation101.com. We have DVD titles on every RV topic imaginable. At Explorer RV, we understand that a recreational vehicle is one of the biggest purchases you'll ever make. That's why we really take the time to discover what kind of insurance you require. Then we'll tailor a policy to that level of coverage. As your needs change over time, we'll check back to ensure your policy is still providing the value you're looking for. Choose the RV insurance experts. Choose Explorer RV. For current RV news and entertainment, join RV Education 101 on Facebook and Twitter. The RV information is updated on a regular basis, and we offer discounts and specials to all of our friends on these social networks. You can join in on the fun by going to www.rvconsumer.com and clicking on Facebook or Twitter. Happy RV learning! It always amazes me how many people I see adding air to their tires when they pull off of the interstate to refuel. You should never add air to tires when they are hot. Hot air expands and you get false tire pressure readings. Adding or letting air out of a hot tire can lead to over or under inflation. Always check and add air to the tires when they are cold before traveling more than one mile. When we travel by RV, crisscrossing the manicured highways and byways, I contemplate our forefathers' rugged journey westward by horse and wagon. They truly were first-generation American RVers. Join us next time for another episode of Mark's RV Garage. <laughs>